Hello there. I cannot wait for you to hear today's interview with Kyra McCullough, Miss USA 2017 herself. I have to admit, I was kind of fangirling when she agreed to be on the podcast and agreed to let me interview her, and I couldn't contain my excitement, so I just tried to tone it down a little bit and be professional about it, but I was like super giddy on the inside. So Kyra was actually born in Naples, Italy, but raised in Virginia Beach for the majority of her childhood due to the fact that her mom was a chief petty officer in the United States Navy, which exposed Kyra to many different cultures and places at a very young age, including Sicily, Japan, South Korea, and even Hawaii. For as long as she can remember, Kyra has been fascinated with science and the impact it has on our everyday lives. And this passion for science grew from there, leading her to earn her Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry with a concentration on radiochemistry from South Carolina State University. Now Kyra works at the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Kyra is the founder of a self-funded community outreach program called Science Exploration for Kids, or SE4K for short, which creates interactive activities celebrating math and science to cultivate a passion for science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, for children. When not busy with her nonprofit or appearances or partnering with charities and official duties as Miss USA. Kyra enjoys and has a penchant for cooking specialty Italian and soul food cuisines inspired by her early travels. Today, Kyra and I talk about her journey as Miss USA, the greatest lessons and opportunities pageants have afforded her, as well as her advocacy for children and science, her work as a nuclear radiochemist, and how women can support and empower one another. I hope you and hearing I hope you enjoy hearing from this amazing woman and just enjoy the podcast as much as I enjoyed talking with her. You're listening to Miss Style Strength and Grace with Deidre Murphy. This is your one-stop shop for style, fashion, health, and fitness. Deidre's passion is to help empower women to reach their fullest potential, both inside and out. Deidre and her guests will be discussing how to develop your style, health, and lifestyle hacks to energize your day and inspire you to keep reaching higher levels of success. Deidre is a professional fashion stylist, health guru, and Mrs. Washington 2017. It's time to get open and honest with Deidre. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. I am so eager to have Kara. Oh, let me make sure I'm saying it right. Is it Kara or Kyra? Because I say it again. Kyra. Kai. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, let me start over. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Like I said, I am super excited to have Kyra McCullough, Miss USA, on the podcast today. And if being Miss USA wasn't enough, this impressive woman is also a uh, radio chemist at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and she has her Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry with a concentration on radio chemistry from South Carolina State University. So Kyra, I am just eager to have you you on today why don't you give my listeners a little snapshot of a little bit more about your life and and what you've been doing so far as Miss USA so thank you for having me Deidre and stop by Deidre a snapchat snapchat goodness a (laughs) a snapshot of my life basically consists of queen scientist curly hair let's start it over curly hair queen scientist doing her SC4K work. So kind of that's basically what it is. I just entered the scene wearing my hair natural on stage. I have been advocating for STEM education for so many children. And I do that through my nonprofit science exploration for kids. And this entire year has been an opportunity for me to learn more about myself. So um, I just appreciate anyone that has grown with me throughout this year. And that is a snapshot. I love it. So we're going to talk about kind of all those topics, especially the science exploration for kids. Um, But I really wanted to understand a little bit more about your job as a radio chemist. I don't even know what that means at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. So before I became at USA, I worked as a scientist at the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. 
And I did a lot of work surrounding medicinal power reactor research and licensing and regulation and also um, emergency preparedness work. So when natural disasters happen or adversaries, we have to make sure there are emergency plans in place at the nuclear facilities that we license. So I did a lot of checking the parameters for that and also doing a lot of on-site inspections at nuclear power plants. Okay, wow. Actually, that'll be really interesting to a lot of my listeners. I don't know if you're familiar with Washington State much, but I live in eastern Washington, and we have the Hanford site out here, which is the home of a nuclear reactor as well. So a lot of my listeners are actually engineers and scientists and women that work out at what we call the site. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, right. It's perfect. <laughs> I love it. So hopefully they'll they'll understand all of what you just said and be like, oh yeah, I know exactly what she does. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we talk about like what sparked an interest in your life for chemistry and, and science, I would love to hear more about your upbringing. I was doing a little bit of research on you and I found out that you were born in Naples, Italy. You moved around a lot as a child and I just want to know more about that and what were some of the life lessons and why did you move around so much as a as a youth my mom spent 23 years in the navy and that gave us the opportunity to live in different countries visit different countries but it was more of an opportunity to expose us to worldwide culture and acceptance Uh, Oftentimes, I meet a lot of friends that have never even left their state or traveled anywhere internationally for that matter. And um, what I learned growing up and what I still take now is that we're all human beings and we have to know how to respect each other and accept each other's differences as well. But also, we can all work cohesively together for a better world. So I've I've had Japanese friends. I still do. I, I love everything about Japanese culture. I frequent a lot of Korean restaurants and I, um, you know, um, critique the food because I know what authentic Korean food tastes like. And, <laughs> and I mean, it all just all ties back in because it's about worldwide culture and acceptance. And I'm thankful that my mother was in the military to give us that option. What did not only like living in different countries and, and communities teach you, um, but also, what did being in a military family teach you? I know that there's probably a lot of discipline that comes with that and just life lessons. I would love to hear a bit about what are some of the, the lessons you learned from a military family and how does that translate into life or Miss USA? So, so many lessons I learned from being a military family. For starters, um, discipline was always number one. And you have to take accountability for yourself a lot. And... Um, My parents were very strict growing up, and I know they did it for a reason because they wanted all of us to be prepared and successful. So we had to be independent at young ages, which I'm thankful for. But, you know, also growing up in the military proved to me that there's so many other options and ways to to build your brand, to to get a career in this world because um, sometimes some people go into the military as, you know, second option but some people love the military so it comes with a a certain territory and for me it wasn't something I wanted to do but I was thankful that my mother gave us the opportunity to see a woman firsthand working hands in the field um dictating a lot of you know what was going to be dictated just like being a leader amongst so many other men in her in her in her branches and her um platoons and stuff so being in the military just opened us up to you know early leadership and exposure to independence and, you know, taking accountability for yourself. I love that. Especially, I think that's such a good message for our current youth. And so many people are passing over that accountability and that responsibility for yourself. I think that's such a, an amazing message for you to share with this incredible platform and, and microphone that you have as being Miss USA. So I just want to say a huge thank you for, for sharing that message. Um, with moving around so much as a kid, you know, were there ever any difficulties with, you know, transferring from one school to the next or always kind of being the new kid? Like, what was that like growing up? And so I moved first to Japan when I was in the third grade. Uh, luckily for me, my brother made a friend and I became friends with his sister, and she and I still talk till today. Uh, it was more so difficult coming back from overseas back to the stateside because I was not hip on any of the fashion trends. I like totally <laughs> shopped at 
underwear that I'm going to keep disclosed <laughs> that I shouldn't have shopped at and had no idea. I was still wearing Skechers. I didn't know how to do my hair because, you know, overseas, the people just got whatever was in the BX. That's like the grocery store for the military area people. I didn't see any music videos. Like, I didn't see the Survivor music video until, like, 2000 and maybe, like, five or something. Oh because I never saw God. it. Because the internet was really slow then yeah. as well. There's so many things that we were kind of, like, left out on um, that was more difficult to transition back into coming back from overseas to the States. But, you know, with due time, I was able to get hip. Uh, I patiently waited for our Wi-Fi to work. <laughs> and I just, you know, read, like, a lot of magazines. And I was able to make a few friends, like, in the sixth grade. Just the girls I saw that were, like, my height and everything. And um, that's how I made friends. But one thing I will also add to coming back to the States after being overseas is that um, – it's such a smaller community when you're like overseas living on military bases. So you're not like, you feel the need to, to want to accomplish a lot because there isn't much to do out there. So you want to hold on to something or be a part of some type of like team or group. And I had a lot of like courage in myself when I was younger to just go out and try things that I've always wanted to do regardless of what anyone thought. And I don't think a lot of my peers had that. I think people were too concerned. People thought, like, I didn't know how to dance or cheerlead, but I tried off for step team, cheerleading team, basketball team. Didn't make any of that type of stuff until high school, though. But I did it anyway. Good for you. <laughs> so did you make any of those sports in high school, you said? You... Yeah, I played basketball in high school and ran track. Okay. Okay. We were a little opposite. I didn't. I was not a track or athlete star by any means, but I did do cheerleading. So I understand the the discipline that comes to do a team sport for sure. <laughs> um, so you ended up back in the states, middle school area era. By the way, I was still wearing Skechers in middle school, so maybe I was just out of the loop on fashion. <laughs> right. And I remember we'd wear like the Skechers and then the Lei brand flare jeans did you remember those uh, yeah oh yeah. yeah i was all about those i think i had five pairs one for every day of the week <laughs> nice lucky you oh not even it was like they were terrible but anyway just we always can look back and make fun of ourselves right <laughs> um so we ended you ended up back in the states you were in virginia is that correct yeah okay virginia and then you went on to go to South Carolina State University. I want to know what sparked your interest to study science there as well as radiochemistry. Well, in high school, well, excuse me, let's backtrack. Um, I've always been in love with science, literally since the day I can remember for whatever strange reason. I had turtles growing up. Aww. I had stickers, you know, like it was just like the whole night, dogs, but I always uh, loved everything about science. I found a science kit when I was younger in a trash room, and I brought it home to my mom. Uh, wait, wait, but a I trash room? Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like people throw away like good stuff. So <laughs> I had nothing to do all day. I would go down there and kind of like rummage around, and I would find like bird cages that could be like fixed up. So we were like cleaning out bird cages and like <laughs> repainting them, and stuff. just like repurposing a lot of treasure in a sense. So I went on to study chemistry in college because I was good at it, and I liked it. I didn't necessarily know what a chemist did, but when I got to college, it just worked out because I was able to get a scholarship and study radio chemistry, which is like nuclear chemistry, and I just fell in love with nuclear energy and medicinal research and how and how it's like it, it's, it works, and it does help out the world, so... I just fell in love with that aspect, and I went on to study that stuff, and now I am here today. <laughs> so beauty and brains. I love it. Nice. Although, going from rummaging around in the trash to being all glamorous on stage at Miss USA, you know. Get a grown can do Rags to riches, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Different way. So I, I read somewhere that you disliked math. Is that true, or was that just like a rumor that I read somewhere? And if so, how did you get over that hurdle with math to go into chemistry? Because there's a lot of correlation between math and science. Definitely a rumor. Never disliked it. I struggled with it. Okay. I wasn't the. I didn't really comprehend it as like quickly as some of my peers in the classroom. And I didn't have a learning disability, but I think when I think I know I learned differently at the time. But I don't fault the teacher for not giving that attention to every student. 
that was needed. But I do feel like she left like a huge chunk of us out and didn't provide as much support in that area. So I overcame my math anxiety in the eighth grade. I had a phenomenal eighth grade math teacher and Mrs. Newsom broke everything down step by step by step. And that's how I tutor my students. Actually, we break everything down for them to understand it. And actually, I don't tell them what they did wrong. I make them look at the answer and I say, is that correct? And they look at themselves and they're like, you know what? It's not. And I'm like, exactly. So um, I love math now. It's it's all a part of chemistry. It's a part of everything that we do from when we're, when we're shopping, taking percentages off our clothes, when we're in a restaurant tipping somebody, when we're trying to to split the split the cab bill of our friends. Right. It's, it's where it's our shoes it's it's every single it's, it's everywhere literally so, fractions like how much is a quarter cup if i have that or exactly exactly so it's literally everywhere and um i overcame it by mainly that math teacher but also persistence because i knew i loved science but i knew i had to be good at math and i wanted to be good at math so i would call the homework helpline homework helpline every night to get help i would go to um like standardized tests, tutoring during my study breaks in school rather than taking a nap during that time. Not that you could take a nap, but um, I would do that and get all my homework done. So when, the, when the, like, the day was over, I would go to basketball practice, go home, text on my phone all, all night long, go to sleep. That's so inspiring, especially because, you know, you could have chosen to take a nap or, you know, just done something different with your time and choosing to overcome your anxiety about math. That's so, like I said, inspirational. I kind of had the opposite. I was decent at math, but I hated science and I just never really pursued getting better at chemistry because I was like, ah, I'm never going to need that. <laughs> I hear that a lot. So I have a lot of students out with that and I still get messages today saying, thank you for helping me. I thought I was never going to understand it. And I like scream to all these messages and I keep them because they mean a lot to me. Oh, and is that what you think is going to be one of the lasting memories for you? Like as you move on into another aspects of your life is like going back and remembering all those messages from like kids and students that you've worked with. Absolutely. Because I know the type of person I am. I commend a lot of people for being brave or for helping me or being role models. So when I received that, when I received that same gratitude in return, uh, it's it's fulfilling. It really is. And I appreciate every student that sends me a message or even the parents that send me messages. If you had one message from a student or even a parent or a story that you have that you're just going to remember for the rest of your life, what would that be? Ooh, there's so many. So, well, the first one that came to my mind was probably the first student that I tutored when I moved to the D.C. area. This young man was in private school and um, was like failing chemistry and his mom brought me in to help him out. And she said, you know, we'll call him John. <laughs> She's like, uh, John understands the material now because of you. So it's like, I get a, like, so many messages like that or like parents um, after becoming Miss USA, my daughter looked at the television and saw your curly hair and said, mom, my curly hair looks just like hers. And she's a scientist. Like I want to be a scientist. <laughs> Like, I get a lot of messages like that, and it really means a lot. I love that. That's so inspirational. And I remember when you won Miss USA and, like, all the news outlets were like, she wore her hair natural. And, like, to me it was just like, well, yeah, like, it looks stunning. Like, why wouldn't she? <laughs> so even though I'm not a – I don't have curly hair, um, you know, it was still awesome to see that on my aspect as well and just see, too, that you were sparking conversation about it. Yeah, thank you. So let's, well, I want to back up for a second because I want to ask this question before I talk about like Miss USA or Miss Universe or more pageanty stuff. But I know you have your program, the Science and Exploration, or what is it called again? SE4K is what I remember in my head, but what does that stand for? And how do you help encourage young students and, and boys and girls that have an interest in math and science? So you said, what have I done to say that again, please? Sorry. I know that was like five questions all at once. Um, what oh. is the SE4K and what does that stand for? And then okay. also like, how do you help mentor and teach youth that have an interest in math and science? SE4K stands for science exploration for kids. And the way I encourage mentor and what's another word? 
inspire many kids that want to study science is by exposing them to the opportunities that are available. Show them other role models that are in these areas. Explain to them that something as simple as your cell phone, your laptop, uh, how you unlock your automated doors now, all this was engineered by tech people, scientists. So when I show them that they can change the world by by having an idea and building a team, that's how we progress and show them that you should have interest in this area because you could be the one that's the next Bill Gates, that's the next Steve Jobs, and it's awful that I'm only naming men. You could be um, a, a tech startup woman. You could be the next Sheryl Sandberg. So I show them that. You can be Miss USA and a scientist who's building a science program and, and, and building some, some toys in the future, too, that I'll talk about later, later, later on. But it's, it's, the options are available, but it's, it's all about the ubiquity and showing them that they could be the ones that are, are changing the future. I love that. It sounds like actually when I used to be a teacher and I would just try to get kids and excited about reading or, or whatever. And, you know, I might ask them, what do they want to be when they grow up? And they're like, Oh, I want to be a, a video game maker or something like that. I'm like, well, yeah, that's awesome. I think that's a great idea for you, but you need to be able to read and write and know basic math skills in order to do that. And then they'd be like, Oh, okay. Now I'll read the story tonight. <laughs> I'm like, yes. Yes. Reading is so essential. And that's what I learned when I teach kids. It's like either, they don't know algebra or they don't know what they're reading. Mm -hmm. So reading comprehension is so important. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, that was always my uh, my platform, not only as a teacher, but uh, my emphasis with my degree was in children's literacy. But so it's, it's similar. I mean, as far as like, you know, you got to have those foundations, just like you said with math, like you had to be able to break it down and know those step-by-step -step foundation piece. So then you could work up to more advanced algorithms and, and processes within that subject matter. So now is the SE4K, the science exploration for kids, is that a program that you created or you started to collaborate with after becoming Miss Washington DC and then also Miss USA? Like, tell me how that collaboration started. I started this program when I was in college and I was self-funded and I just kind of did it recreationally. I would just go to out schools and do a project for an hour after school. And I did it from a personal place in life because I knew that I love science, but I didn't fully comprehend everything in the classroom. And I discover when I tutor kids that I make everything relatable to something as simple as washing dishes or baking that's how we're able to understand our fractions or, or how soap is breaking away from fat bonds and stuff i start the program on that basis to make everything understandable and relatable to kids and when i first got my job in the dc area i went out and did the same thing and then someone said you know you should really turn this into an actual like nonprofit. So I had a school and I had a couple of kids and they paid, you know, for like six weeks at a time. So the business grew well before I even had the title. And um, I'm thankful the title was able to help me leverage what I love so much and what's been my passion and what I put my personal money behind because I believed in it and wasn't looking for anything in return, but just to help out other students. I love that. And it shows too. And I talk about this a lot in my podcast and other avenues but how pageantry can be used as a leverage or a tool to help grow the other passions in life. So I love that. I totally agree. Yeah. What other ways have you found that pageantry has helped, you know, leverage your, your passions or your endeavors in your, you know, real life, so to speak? <laughs> well, for one, the, the title holds weight. And it's kind of like that golden ticket into places or people that I want to talk to. I mean, I've met three sharks already. And I talked to Damon John the other day. I've met Mark Cuban and I'm, I know a few people on his team. I've met Kevin O'Leary and I, and I pitched my program to him and he wow. found an interest wow. in it. And he even said that you're using your title for the right thing. And, and he commended me for that. So it holds weight, but it doesn't hold weight unless the woman behind it brings the substance as well. Um, so, I, you know, I'm thankful. And I've, I've improved so much on in my interview skills, my personality, my fashion. I literally just went through my closet and threw away everything because I'm like, you know what? I buy the wrong clothes and I'm tired of buying the wrong clothes. And I'm actually tired of buying clothes in general. So, <laughs> so it just helped out a lot and I, I'm thankful for it. 
Yeah. I love yeah. that. Well, anytime you need to get rid of things from your closet, you can just send them over to me <laughs> because where I live, they probably wouldn't be in fashion for another five years. So <laughs> Gotta get it together out there. I love it. I'll just take your, your cast offs and they'll be like brand new to me. So I love it. <laughs> um, I want to know what got you started in competing in pageantry. I, I know you did Miss South Carolina university, which was kind of a, a local title for your college there in South Carolina. Was that your first pageant? Yes. Nope, no, 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 no. My first pageant was Miss Black and Gold for the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. And, I mean, none of this stuff equates to anything that I've done at the Miss USA level. But they were fun. So, yeah, I, I was queen of my university my senior year. And that's because people were encouraging me, like, hey, you should try this out. And I'm like, me? I don't even know how to do my hair. But I learned a lot about myself through that process. And I discovered that there is a change that can be made through pageantry. So when I started the DC USA system, I was at work for a year or so, a year, and um, I first competed in December 2014. And I wanted to compete in December 2013, but a friend or a boyfriend that was actually discouraged me from doing it, and I listened to him. But then oh, that following oh. June, he actually passed away, and I re- and it was like a quick reminder that life waits on no one. So if you want to do something, don't let anyone hold you back. Run to the field for what you want. Invest in as much as possible, and that's what I did. And I just I ran for the pageant system because it was something I've secretly always wanted to do. So I told myself, if you're going to do it, you know, do it all the way and not halfway because you'll be wasting your time. And I just went out and did something that my heart has always desired. I love that. And you were first runner up the first two times, correct? That you did it? Yes. So I know the feeling of being first runner up. (laughs) What did losing, quote unquote losing, teach you? And um, would you go back and change anything if you could? Losing. Uh, Okay. Losing taught me that... It's not your time. There's always room for improvement and you don't have weaknesses. So I was not like shocked at all. I'm like, I'm just a girl walking off the street who's going to compete for this title against, you know, some women that have done it for like much longer than me. Like, like who am I to have a chip on my shoulder, you know? So to even get first runner up then. I mean, I like literally blew myself out the water, but I know other people were impressed by me, but I'm like, y'all don't even know how surprised I am about myself right now. But um, I, I just took it as a learning lesson. I was like, you know what? It's not my year. It's totally fine. This is my first year doing this and I'm not seasoned enough and I don't know what it is I'm supposed to be doing with this title or, or how I can affect change with it. So I use that, you know, every year of losing as one more year to come back with much more vengeance and fire to move. And I'm glad the judges saw that I wasn't ready then because I wouldn't be Miss USA right now if I got the title the first year or even the second year. Yeah. Everything happens for a reason. I think that saying of like, you know, you might ask for something from God and he has like three answers like no, yes, or not right now or not yet. And I don't know what your faith is, but I think, for me, like that's such a huge life lesson that I try to, to always remember, like, you know what, it might not be right now. It might be later on. And it's always setting us up for a bigger vision and dream than we ever could have imagined. Absolutely. So you went on to, you went, um, the first two times you competed at Miss US or Miss DC, excuse me, first runner up two years in a row, finally when your third year, Um, then you went on to compete at Miss USA representing Washington, DC. What was your favorite moment competing at Miss USA? Obviously besides winning. Well, for starters, we made my favorite moment competing from that week was, um, just the lasting friendships and also having the buffet there. It was very (laughs) convenient not having to worry about certain groceries and I mean the food was good so I felt like I ate good every night and I loved eating early I like eating like before six for some reason because I sleep well at night and um 
It also, it was amazing when I was standing in top three, I thought we all answered our question and I looked up at my family and I could just see how proud they were of me in that very moment. So there was just so many different times that, that make competing for Miss USA worth it. Yeah. Well, we, we briefly mentioned it earlier, but you kind of sparked a, a lot of media and attention about the fact that you wore your hair naturally curly. You know, what sparked that decision for you just because a lot of women, especially with that, that naturally curly hair, choose to either straighten it or do a lot of um, like flat ironing and then curling from there. What made you decide to just rock your naturally curly hair? I've worn my hair curly my entire life. I don't necessarily like to straighten my hair. And I knew that I wanted to be myself on that stage. I told everyone from day one that I wanted to wear Even the first time I competed for Miss DC, I said I wanted to wear it curly. And they were like, um, Are you sure? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they're like, I don't think it's going to respond well. And when I did win DC, I said I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I was going to do it regardless if someone told me not to. Because I knew that I wanted to be myself. Like, that's the only way you're going to win. And I tell every girl that, I'm like, I can't stress it enough. You have to be yourself. Because no one can no one can tell you how to be you. Mm. That, that resonates with me so much. Especially last year when I finally won Mrs. Washington. I had continued to try to keep my hair long for that, like, oh, a pageant girl needs to have her hair long. And then I would add extensions to make it look even longer and fuller because I have really thin hair. And uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago now, I finally was like, you know what? I just really want to chop my hair off and do like a lob. And and that was me. And it, it was healthier for my hair because I needed to just cut off all those dead ends. But anyway, as I was gearing up to compete for Mrs. Washington my, my third time, a lot of people kept telling me like, oh, you should add extensions and, you know, make your hair long like pageant hair, even if it is just for the night. And I was like, you know what? I really like having shoulder length hair and this this shortcut. I'm just going to do it and rock it. And that, I ended up winning. <laughs> so, right, exactly. You, just you were comfortable you. Hey, you just showed in your energy. I commend you. Congratulations. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> I mean, I had a little bit of uh, help in there with some teasing and stuff to get some volume, obviously. But, you know, I was like, I just really want to wear my hair short. So it was just got to be you. Um, I did want to ask, what was your favorite learning moment or what did you learn and take away from getting to compete at Miss Universe? I, when I competed for Miss Universe, I can't even lie to you. I lost myself a little bit. I did. Mm -hmm. I was listening to internet trolls. They were saying, oh, she's not fit to be Miss USA. She doesn't live up to the standard. Like what kind is this? Blah, blah, blah. And I listened to it and they're like, she's not sexy enough. And I went all out and I did the stuff that I did not need to do. And if there's anything that I learned that I wish I could go back and do, I, I would change a few things. And that's what I said in the beginning, like being yourself. Like, and, and then when you're there, like you have to make yourself into something that's marketable or, or brand. So, so knowing how to take great content photos for your Instagram is like extremely, extremely important. And just, you know, just putting yourself out there for, for the ambassadors to see that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is I remember it must have been during your week at Miss US or Miss Universe, excuse me. I wrote an article for the Pageant Planet and I talked about your, there was a cute white outfit that you had with this white billowing sleeve and your, and your pose was a little bit more dramatic. And at one point you were wearing these like white pants and you kind of had like this modely pose and everyone was giving you backlash over that. And can you, you tell me a little bit about that experience and what? Yeah. Ooh. I mean, there was like a lot of support and then there were a lot of critics. Um, and the thing is like, I recently took another photo just like that for the program book. And it's very model-esque. It, it's amazing because you see models pose like that. But uh, it was it was alarming. I just had to just take it down. I was like, I don't really want to have to go through this. But that proved to me that people in the world are waiting for that one time for you to make a mistake and for them to blow it out of proportion. Mm -hmm. And for those that are listening that haven't seen the photo, you were sitting in like a 
a chair with these white pants on this white top and it was not a I, I wouldn't even call it like a risque pose but it was a very model like kind of vogue pose and the backlash was that the fact that your legs were kind of open in the pose if I remember correctly yeah and then you ended up posting you took that picture down and posted a different picture in the same outfit just to kind of yeah. stop the haters so if anybody's listening that was the reference to that but I I yeah, it just always shocks me how much people, are, like you said, are just waiting to try and pounce. Yes. So for you, to, yep. Yeah. So I commend you for for staying true to yourself. And either way, I really loved the outfit. So that's that's yeah. all that matters. <laughs> um. So as Miss USA, you're kind of wrapping up the end of your reign here and getting ready to crown the next Miss USA. Are there any last few projects or? programs that you're working on to to wrap up as you end this year well my uh science program and just like setting up like meetings and stuff to make sure that i'm solidifying a lot of things for the spring and for the fall coming up um i've been on steve harvey two times doing science experiments so that's going to continually go as well and we're going to create you know uh, just, you know, multiple episodes where we do fun science experiments on set with Steve Harvey. But my science program has been my number one priority because I really want to get that off the ground. And I want that to be the only thing that I focus on because I know the need there is in the world to encourage students into the techs and the sciences. But before we even encourage them, we need to give them the resources to to pass these classes, to to give them the the courage, or so they're not intimidated by math and science subjects. I love that. And so you're going to continue to be on the Steve Harvey show even after your reign is over. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, he doesn't say the wrong winner or anything of the science experiments on the show. Right, right. The next episode will air though in June. Okay. Well, I'm excited to see that. I'll have to keep my eye out for that. Um, what would you hope to be your legacy as Miss USA? Like if people think back on, on you and your year, what do you want them to remember? I want them to remember and I want my legacy to be this trailblazing double minority who, who wanted to be authentic on stage, who wore her hair curly, who wasn't afraid to to show that she loves, you know, to have beauty and brains and, and isn't afraid to, to put on heels and makeup and take all that off and walk into a chemistry lab and, and talk about ethanols and, and figure out what's going on in these hair products. I just want them to see that a woman stepped up and said that she can be everything and she doesn't care what anyone thinks. She can be bohemian chic. She can be high fashion and, and she just encouraged so many people throughout her reign and, and through her science program because that's where her passion has always been. I love that. And that's, I think, going to definitely be the lasting legacy for you. That's what I think of when I think of you. I think of beauty, intelligence, you know, breaking the mold for not only what a pageant queen should be, but, you know, just women in general. Like, women in general aren't typically thought of as the scientists, the nuclear chemists, the, you know, all those predominantly male roles so I think that empowerment message is going to be so strong for years to come yes thank you yeah so I have a few rapid fire questions just for fun <laughs> I want to know are you a sweets eater or a savory food eater savory food Ooh, can you give me your favorite savory food if you had to pick one black and salmon black and salmon oh yum that sounds What's amazing it's called greens and a lemon drizzle on top. Ooh. Lemon butter reduction. Oh, that sounds yummy. I didn't have collard greens until this last November. I was visiting my brother. We went to this place that had like chicken and waffles. And he was like, you have to try collard greens. And I'd never had them before. And they were good. Oh, no. So my dad's collard greens. Not everyone can make collard greens. Like, I'm glad <laughs> you tried them. But I'm sure I've, I've got better for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the next time I'm in New York or something, we have to... I'll take you up on that and we can compare. <laughs> yes. Um, if you could sit down with one actor or actress and have coffee, who would it be and why? Rapid fire? Ooh. Um, ooh. Jessica Alba. Okay. She, I love how she transitioned herself from entertainment into business. 
And I respect her for that. So that's an actress that I would love to sit down and talk with. I love that. If you could interview anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? If I could interview anyone, I would like to interview the late Annie Malone Turnbow because she built a hair care empire in the early 1900s and in the St. Louis area. So this was like a million dollar like black woman who studied chemistry and built and made hair care products. Most people know her as Mad- know Madam C.J. Walker, but she was Madam C.J. Walker's mentor. And I commend her because she created this hair, hair care empire, but also created jobs for people and put women through school. And if there was anyone else I could meet alive, I would love to, well, you know, I just talked to Damon John on the phone, but I really want to sit down with him and, and just talk about a whole bunch of different things and ideas that I have and get a lot of insight because he knew how to market himself without going to school. And that right there is the power of persistence and and finding out about yourself, not only paying for someone to tell you what to do or tell you something that's free in a library. I love that. Um, Well, if you do get to meet him in person, I'd love to hear more about his uh, nuggets of wisdom. (laughs) If you could tell your younger self any piece of advice, what would it be? Dear Kyra McCullough, maybe about ten, nine years old, you won that uh, musical chair contest. Although you let that other girl win because you felt bad for her, and there's a lot of con artists in this world, she's just one of many, and you're someone who's going to succeed. So don't allow this moment to be a hindrance to why you're afraid to praise your accomplishments. So go out there into the world, and if someone asks you what you're doing or or what you plan to do with your life, upsell yourself to the most highest point possible because someone's only going to hold you to the standard that you put yourself at. Ooh, I like that. I'm going to have to remember that one. (laughs) So why did you let somebody else win the musical chairs? Now I'm curious. (laughs) Because, like, I bumped her out of the – I booty bumped her out of the seat. Okay, backtrack this was at my friend's ninth uh you know nine-year-old birthday party i booty bumped this girl off the seat and she started crying i always win musical chairs and (laughs) she was crying so i got up and act like i was hurt and i let her win and then maybe like 10 minutes later she was at the prize table like na 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 i won and like my spirit was crushed because I'm like, that could have been my Lisa Frank journal. <laughs> uh, I remember that stuff. I had all of her pens and notebooks. Oh my gosh. With the <laughs> Like I wanted that unicorn journal with the mm-hmm. big bright rainbow on there. Oh yeah. Lisa Frank. She was popular. <laughs> oh, I, I do have some questions that I, I typically ask all my guests. Um, do you have any favorite resources that you've been like binging on, whether it's a book or like a podcast or anything that you'd love to share? Just for like self-help stuff? Or... Yeah, self-help or, you know, motivational, inspirational, anything really. Um, being honest, it's so unfortunate, but I don't have time to really sit down and read books anymore. So I use Audible. This is my go-to now. I listen to books while I'm cleaning up, when I'm in the shower. And, I mean, there's, there's so many options up here for you to, to delve into books. And, and it's also fun because I learn how to be a character when I listen to other people read books. You have to know how to animate yourself. Make yourself sound believable. Make people want to listen to you because no one wants to listen to some – some uptight monotone speaker like have personality and bubbliness and bravado in your voice and and inflection in in your in your tones it's so important and um i carry a journal with me everywhere now it's one i got recently and i haven't filled it up but every time i have an idea i jot something down in it and i go back and double check it and everything's in there for my to-do list and my action plans like literally everything well that's kind of like brain on paper I have that same, I have a journal with me all the time just because then that way I can like go back and be like, oh yeah, did I do this, this, and this, and this? Okay, good. And it helps me sleep at night too because I'm like, okay, if there's anything that's running through my head of like, oh, I got to do this and this and this tomorrow, if I write it down, then it's like, okay, now I can fall asleep because it's, 
it's on I'm paper. Asleep, yes. <laughs> um, if you had to narrow it down to three core values that dictate all your decisions, what would those three core values be? Do you have a passion for it? And is it setting your soul on fire? Two would be, are you really going to put the hard work into completing the task? And three, does it support your mission in life and how you want to affect change in yourself? Because you have to put yourself first. You can't pour from an empty cup. And how you want to transfer that to other people in the world. Mm, That's so true. I, I just did a monologue podcast the other day and it was called you can't pour from an empty cup and it was all about like self-care like you have to be able to take care of yourself first to, in order to serve others with true purpose so i love that um as we wrap up where can my guests you know find and follow you in a good way not stalker way you know whether it's on social media websites what resources do you have for them so you can always follow my Instagram at real Kyra McCullough. My Twitter is just my first and last name, Kyra McCullough. And what other social media platforms? Oh, there's Facebook. And um, follow me on that, Kyra McCullough. <laughs> but also my website is info because somebody's trying to extort me right now. I know. And, <laughs> and um, in my sign stuff, sc4k.org, it's really important. And, um, yeah, just follow me on that kind of stuff because that's where I'll be posting what I'll be progressing into because I'm also planning on, on having like a a science YouTube channel and I'll be inviting a lot of kids on board. So I'll be soliciting that for that soon as well. So for any children in the area, if I'm ever in your town, we'll be looking to do like hands-on experiments and make them fun and do videos with students. So yeah, that's awesome. I'm so excited to hear more about that as it gets going. Thanks. I do. Oh, I wanted to share this story. I was, I should have shared it at the beginning, but I wanted to share with our listeners when I first met you, it was actually at an event over in Bellevue, Washington. And I had hopped in an elevator to get to this, um, expo that day. It was the beauty brand believe expo. And you were in the elevator and you weren't dolled up as your like Miss USA self. And I asked you, I was like, Oh, is this the floor where the beauty believe expo is? And you were, I was like asking you for directions. <laughs> And you're so gracious on the elevator to tell me where to go. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. And then later that day, lo and behold, you show up and you're all glammed out in your beautiful yellow dress with your beautiful yellow leather jacket, which I still remember. (laughs) And I I introduced myself to you after you you spoke and did a little Q&A with our MC that day. And you're like, yeah, we met in the elevator this morning. Yeah. I wanted to take my hand and just like shove it on my palm of my fa- or my face and face palm right there. I felt so embarrassed. I was like, "Oh my gosh, I met Miss USA in the elevator this morning, and I didn't even realize it." <laughs> I'll give you a pass because we share the same name, you know, Deidre, <laughs> which is my middle name. So I'll give you a pass. <laughs> okay, good to know. I'm so glad. And you spell Deidre correctly. Yes, our parents did. Yes, they did. <laughs> yep, I appreciate that. I was like, yes, if her little name is Deidre and she spells it the right way. Okay. I know, right? I hate when I see D-E-I-D-R-E. I'm like, no, it's D-R-A. I know. <laughs> I know. Or people will say like Deidre or Deirdre. And I'm like, it's Deidre. <laughs> Oh, exactly. <laughs> anyway, well, I just want to say thank you, a huge thank you again for agreeing to be on the podcast today. I know you're crazy busy as Miss USA and, you know, wrapping things up as the final like month or so of your, your reign comes. So again, I just want to say thank you and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Oh, my last question. I'm kind of scatterbrained today. My last question is always, something I ask all my guests and it's very open to interpretation, but I always ask, what does it mean to do things with style and grace to you? So doing things with style and grace to me means it's kind of hard. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So doing things with style and grace isn't only about fashion, but it's about how you respond and not react to situations. And, and how you bring a presence to to a room or to to other people or to to your passion. So style and grace are are they work synergistically together. 
and um, they're both inviting. So if you are able to work with both of them and show the world both of them, maybe a lot of work can get done as well. Oh, I love that. Well, you are definitely the epitome epitome of style and grace and you were so gracious today on my on my show so thank you again and I look forward to following your journey as you continue on thanks thank you so much DJ it was fun thank you hey ladies thanks for listening and we hope you enjoyed today's episode to help empower more women please be a doll and rate review and subscribe to this podcast For show notes and other free resources we mentioned today, go to stylebydeidra.com.